بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, A warm welcome to all of you um, Yes, thank you very much You can keep telling us uh, where you're from um, It's always nice to know uh, where all our colleagues are coming from um, We will inshallah get started right away because we do have uh, quite a lot of ground to cover um, in this next hour. Inshallah ta'ala, this is our second session in our study of um, Surah Yasin, the 36th chapter of the Holy Quran, that was described as being the heart of the Holy Quran. If we look at the breakdown, uh, as we broke down the, the, uh, the surah to be covered over our uh, five sessions, Last time we covered an introduction and we covered the first section, which I entitled The Message and the Messenger, but we did have uh, one verse left, which was verse 12. So what we're going to do today is quickly recap the breakdown, if you like, of that first section to remind us of where we've just come from and to give us a context to study that 12th verse, which we'll do uh, fairly quickly. Then we'll go into the rest of today, which is our second session, uh, which all of it is a story, uh, which I've entitled here, The Earnest Caller, for reasons that you'll be, uh, be able to see. So what we're going to do, first of all, once we start that session, is we'll have an introduction, a short introduction to Quranic storytelling uh, and how that might help us as we approach stories in, in the Holy Quran, and then jump right in and see what we can learn from the story of what I've called the earnest caller. Very good. But first of all, an overview of last week's uh, lesson, so we can just get that last verse from, from, from that section. Uh, it was the section I entitled The Message and the Messenger. And this was how the verses broke down. We had uh, an introductory section where, which started with, you know, oath swearing and, and highlighted the the gravity, the grandeur of this revelation. A, an incredible recital full of wisdom as if it's freshly sent down from God who's the Lord of all might and all compassion. Uh, to emphasize what? That you, O prophet, really surely are one of the people sent by God. And you are on an incredible straight path. I've sort of circled that because the imagery of the path will keep coming back to us, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see. We then, have, we then had another section, which we covered uh, perhaps quicker at, at the end of the last section. And this section was simply saying, again, to give comfort to the Prophet ﷺ and the believers and to highlight that people, when they react to a message of this grandeur, the message is clear, but there's something within people that will ultimately determine how they respond. And so there's a group who have particular traits and the highlighted traits where they closely follow the remembrance, the remembrance being one of the names of the, of the holy book. I, they're keen to be reminded of what makes sense of how to really live in the world and how to perceive the world and the reality that underlies it. And they want to follow this remembrance. So they're keen to tread a true path in life. And they have this deep awe, a deep sense of the majesty of the all merciful Lord, whose goodness covers everything. So these people, have a great promise from Allah, a great forgiveness and a great reward. And so the people who choose not to do that, they care nothing for the remembrance. They don't want to be reminded of anything. They don't want to follow anything except what serves very much self-interest. They don't care about what's unseen. 
They don't feel they owe anything to anyone for the kindnesses that have come to them. They have no sense except for the majesty of themselves. Then instead of describing their traits, it just describes the consequence of that way of being where they hold their held up high. And I'm sorry, I raised my head quite a lot last time. I got carried away by the acting, I think. But their, their heads are raised high in pride, not because they're great, but because they're prisoners. Internally, they're prisoners. They don't know how to look down anymore. Victims, if you like, of their own very, very poor choices. And they have these walls in front of them and from behind them. While they can't even walk forward on this path that everybody else is. And so you have this image of imprisoned by lust, by bad choice, and they can't do anything. And so if they call names to the believers and they do what they can to obstruct them, it's just because these are imprisoned by the most wicked choices that they've made. And so you have these two groups who are responding to this incredible message. And what's going to be coming up next is this constant Quranic interest, you could almost call it uh, justice, uh, which is the comfort that God gives the believers that this is, the justice will become. If you do what's good and you tread what's right, you will always come on top because the one who sent down the wise book is the all wise and is also the ever invincible. And so you will have your proper place. You will have your recognition. Your deeds will not go forgotten. And the people who've done what they can, they will have their consequences. And so this message of justice is what leads to this last conclusion, if you like, of, uh, of that first section, which is that God's final message is, yes, there are these two vivid images of how someone might respond to that messenger, um, but everything is being written. Everything is being recorded and justice will happen. And so the final section of that last verse of that final verse of that last section was inna, sorry, just one sec. Uh, inna, we saw that inna is a verb, uh, is, a, is a particle to emphasize, surely doubt it not. What? We, we, we bring life to the to the dead and so when when god refers to himself as we it's the we like we say in english as well like a royal we it's the we of majesty of grandeur of greatness and so any act ascribed to the we of god's majesty is a tremendous act and so we in our majesty in our grandeur in our in our all-encompassing might we are the ones who bring the dead back to life the story will be done with justice and that's why we inscribe everything. Sorry, one sec. What does it say here? We write down what they forwarded and what they've left behind. And so in this book of justice, where every soul has what it's earned, Allah is saying we are recording everything. We are recording everything. And what is everything? What really matters to you and me is just two things. And again, the imagery, which is gonna continue into also today's lesson, is the imagery of that straight path, is the imagery of walking towards a destination. As we're walking towards God in life, there are some things we send on to him while we're walking, the things we, we, we send ahead. In a normal sort of caravan that's traveling, you often send scouts ahead. So they can figure out, you know, where's the next oasis, they can prepare everything. So when the caravan comes, everything is ready for them. So it's normal to send scouts ahead. And what is it that you're sending ahead that's going to wait for you to make sure that when you arrive, it's comfortable, it's good, it's what you wanted it to be. What's waiting there for you at the head? It's what you've sent forward, which is your, your, your deeds. And so your, your, your actions are all that, will, that, that you will find at the end of this destination. And so that's the imagery of that which they have sent forward, that which ma qaddamu, that which they've sent forward ahead of themselves, their actions while they're alive, it's all recorded. Wa atharahum. And athar literally, it's your track, it's, it's your tracks, it's your footsteps. When you when you're walking on the path, again, the imagery of, of walking somewhere, 
this journey of life, as you're walking, there's things you send ahead, but there's also footsteps. What happens to footsteps? The people who are walking behind you will tread along those footsteps. And so there's things we also leave behind which are valuable to us. Uh, scholars say, what is it? It's like knowledge you've taught. You, you've left this world, but people are still treading in the footsteps of that knowledge. And that's your deed, which whose effect is still felt in the earth after you're gone. God is inscribing all of that for you. It will not be forgotten. Or they'll say it might be schools that you established. Uh, and so the learning goes on after you or the mosques or the wells or the orchards. Uh, whatever you do, which has been left behind where people are treading in those steps and following you down, all of that is inscribed. All of that is for you. But on the same token, all of that can also be against you. If all you send forward is all that's vile, and all you've left behind is a world that is worse off for the fact that you were in it, it's not for you to say, oh, that's them, it's not me, because they are them, they are they because you are you. You leave behind your traces for people. And so the idea of the legacy, if good, it will be great. I, it's all recorded in your favor. And if bad, it's a great shame, all recorded against you. And the emphasis here is we are recording everything. We and our majesty, we do bring the dead to life. And we are recording what they send forward and the tracks they've left behind them. Wa kulla shay'in and everything, whatever it might be, everything, ahsaynahu. He's very literal in the translation. Uh, I, I said last time I use Arbery because he's quite literal. So it helps us in our comparison of Arabic to English. Uh, the more interpretive translation would have been everything we've encompassed it. Nothing has been missed. In what? Fi imamin mubinin. In a very clear imam. So an imam, you might know, is the imam of a mosque. He's someone we pray behind, we, we follow in prayer or in ritual. In politics, the imam is the ruler of, of a land. And so here, what's the reference to? There's no rulers, politics, there's no prayer leaders that we're speaking of. It's a reference to this ultimate register, uh, which is referred to uh, in the hadith as a loh, or even actually within the Quran, as a loh al mahfuz, which is literally translated as the preserved tablet. You know, in, in, the, in the desert, you inscribe on a tablet. That's your medium for inscribing something you want to stay fixed, if you like. And so the inscribed tablet is a reference to this register of God's knowledge of everything which is going to be. Everything which will be is written and recorded. It's a manifestation, if you like, in creation of God's knowledge, God's unchanging knowledge, because it's true, it's knowledge. And so the reference here is A, there's three statements then of, of the power of God uh, or the might of God. What are the three statements? First of all, we in our majesty, we do bring people back. Justice will be completed. The wisdom of God's plan will be seen by all. And what is the wisdom tied to? It's the deeds that people have earned. And so we are inscribing everything. And our knowledge is so great that everything has been recorded in this register, in this higher register, that everything in this universe is moving in accordance with, as if that's the imam and the universe is all following. And so nothing is escaping the invincibility of God, as we saw last time. Nothing is escaping his plan, his knowledge, his record of everything. And so everything has been recorded in that imam that the whole universe is following now. The clear register of the unchangeable, the all true knowledge of God. Just a small point in this word, ahsa, uh, a little point of Arabic. We'll do a bit of Arabic in and out because we have a lot to cover. It comes from the Arabic word, hasa. I apologize, my Arabic writing is not that clear either, neither is my English. Hasa, uh, which means pebbles. Uh, and what would happen is, you know, if the Arabs and most, most you know, uh, pre-modern peoples actually, if they want to refer to numbers, often they're not, they're, they won't be accurate. They say, oh, there were thousands of people. Or they might say, Oh yeah, 70 years ago, something happened. And all they mean is 
you know, a vague number for, for a large amount, 70, 40, 1,000. But sometimes they want to count properly. And when they want to count, they'll use some, some device, like you'll have an, an abacus, so you might use pebbles. So you want to count carefully, you know, how many camels does the guy have because he wants to record his wealth or pay his tax. So you'll count one, two, three, you reach 10 or you reach 100, you'll place a particular pebble down. You keep writing, reach another 10, another pebble, another 100, another kind of pebble. So the idea of ihsa, which means to, to number, the idea is you're recording something very carefully and it's quite a large amount. So you're, you're recording all the numbers. So that's what they say is the origin of the word ihsa, a very careful record of everything. So that's the conclusion of that first section of the message, the messenger, and the human souls that respond to it, and the power and justice of God that will respond to that. And now we enter our next story, our next segment in the surah. You'll see very clearly how it connects directly to the last segment. Uh, this is a story. And so a little bit before we get into this story, a little bit about stories within the Holy Quran. And I want to uh, point out that my colleague, Dr. Samir Mahmoud, he spoke about an hour uh, last Friday about Quranic stories. So I do uh, uh, refer you back to his lesson. All I want to say here briefly is something that was recorded very nicely by Dr. Nuruddin Itar, uh, who is a, a Hadith scholar uh, from Damascus, who has a very beautiful short introduction to the Quranic sciences called Ulum al-Quran. He has a chapter on Quranic stories, and he has some really nice, insightful statements that, are, that I think are really useful when looking at stories within the Holy Quran. And what he says in there is that uh, in the early modern period, when European plays were translated into Arabic, and the Arabs developed their own sort of genre of plays and theater, uh, it became quite evident that there was a comparison or similarity between how plays are written and how the Quran tells its stories. Uh, how do you write a play? Think, think of a play right now, compare it to a novel. In a novel, you're very descriptive. You, you describe what someone is wearing, the size of their nose, the color of their hair. Um, you, you describe their internal feelings, their thoughts. Their, you know, it's a very descriptive way to tell a story. Whereas a play, the description is left out, you know, if, if it's going to be acted out, then, then the actors are going to portray that. But sometimes we read plays like Shakespeare without any actors. How is, how is the playwright expressing such depth of feeling, of emotion? How does he do that if he's not being so descriptive? It's from the dialogues. He said, he said, they said, they said, this character, that character, that character. And the dialogue is constructed in such a way as to portray emotion, anger, fear, the whole host of emotions are all in speech, uh, in, in the speech acts, if you like, ascribed to each of these actors. And the reader, instead of having the description given to them, the reader is invited into this world. Imagine the scene, imagine what they're wearing. This is London in the 18th century, or it might be France in the 17th, imagine the scene. This is in a court. No, this is in, in the marketplace. Imagine the clothing, imagine the actors, imagine the anger as he says this, as he says that. Quranic stories are very, very similar, which is why it's no surprise that the most used, the most used verb in the entire Holy Quran is what? It's the verb qala, he said. Because Quranic stories typically have very simple scene setting, very simple description of this is the scene, this is where we are. And you immediately jump into qala qala, qala qala, qala qala, qala qala, which is the dialogue, the, the exchange. If it's qala qala qala, then it means he said, he said, he said, within like a single scene or a single exchange. Sometimes the qala breaks, you might get a wa qala, you know, there's a bit of a break and he said, which might indicate some shift within the scene, within the, within the, within what, what, what's, what's happening there. And you, the listener are drawn in to imagine, imagine the scene, imagine the characters, imagine the mood, imagine the intensity. Uh, it's a very beautiful visual speech centered way of describing a set of events, all based on what your power to imagine. It's pulling you in to a scene. And because Quranic stories are not really there to tell you 
about scenes. It's there always part of a larger message that every chapter is conveying. Every, so every story is told in a particular way to complete the arguments of that particular story or that particular surah, I should say. Our surah has started with a very clear scene of its own argument. So you're gonna see that this story is told that we're about to come to in a particular way only to enhance the arguments of how this surah has started and to feed into how the surah's narrative is going to continue. And so every, and so, so because the focus is on the world of the human, you know, the Quran's message is ultimately about us and it's the complexities within us which are determining how we're going to respond. And so the story is always about people within a setting and how they're responding. And so it's within the speech that we're being drawn into the world of the human, drawn into the world of ourselves. And we're gonna see some very great characters and some very poor characters. A simple binary is what these stories often have in, in dialogue. The very, very good, you know, the Moses and the Pharaoh. And we're being drawn into that. And within that, we're finding the complexities of our own little universes for us to choose and learn who do we want to be like? What do we want to be? Wow, he's really brave in that place. Wow, how foolish he is. Observing the unfolding of this theater, if you like, in front of us. We also are drawn to imagine the scenes. You know, in a normal, in normal playwright, he will say scene one, scene two, now we're in here, now we're in the palace. The Quran often gives you very subtle hints of, of, of a shift in scene. You know, a curtains have closed and curtains have opened and, and something has shifted. And so all of that is what you're drawn in to imagine, to picture, to, to move with the story. How much of the Quran is stories? You know, quite a large amount. They say if you bring all the stories together into one place, it's about, I don't recall exactly, it's approximately eight to nine juz or ajza of the Holy Quran. There's 30 ajza, or you might some in the subcontinent they say sapara. There's 13 of them. Oh, sorry, 30 in the in, entire Holy Quran. Eight to nine, you know, almost a third are just stories. Uh, why are stories so central in all traditions? Uh, it's because they are, they, like I said, they, they invite you into their world. They invite you into their scenery. And there's something you can keep revisiting again and again and again. And you learn something from the heroes. You learn something from those moments. As things change in your life, there's things that the stories will speak to you about your own life. Um, and so a lot of the Quran is about these stories, inviting you into the world of these great humans and these very poor humans in comparison. Dr. Nuruddin Itari says one last thing before I look at our story. He says that there's something underlying all of the Quranic stories. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a whole layering of lessons to learn how people are reacting in particular settings but there's an underlying theme in the majority of these stories. And what's the underlying theme in the majority of these stories is God will come to the aid of the believers. Or in another phrase, how frequently, how often has it been that a small group has defeated a very large group by the will of God? In the stories of the prophets, the underlying message always is that the good guys will always win. They will be small, they will be outnumbered, they will be whatever they will be, but the triumph is always with God and his messengers. There's an incredible resilience in these stories of the Holy Quran that they're giving the people of faith. And that's why Dr. Itar in, in that chapter, he, he says, that's partly the secret behind Muslim civilization. Because for the last 1400 years, Islamic civilization has been through a lot. There's been Mongols, there've been crusaders, there've been, there's a whole, and obviously the, the very difficult turmoil of the whole colonial and, and modern period. There's been so much happening uh, in Islamic history that would really seem, you would have thought to wipe out everything, wiping out libraries and schools and scholars and, and so on. But there's this sort of bounce back that always happens in Islamic history things go get a bit bewildering and civ Muslim civilization bounces back stronger than ever, more resilient than ever. And he, and he ties this back to these stories because Muslim civilization is one that's always reciting the Quran. And the Quran is always saying, you guys can do it. Just stay with God, God is with you. 
many difficult times have come and miracle and miracles come to the people who are with God. And so the book is always saying, rise up, be strong. I'm with you. You can do it. You'll win. And so here is then a little story. And the story we're looking at uh, now, it is, it is very, it is completely devoid of f- familiar details and characters. There's no Abraham, there's no Moses, there's no Pharaoh. Um, there's nothing you would, you know, there's no particular scene to tie it to. It's almost told in its abstraction. Uh, and that's, I think, quite fitting if, if we look at how we situated Surah Yasin as the heart of the Holy Quran. It's the core images, the core messages, the p- core points of beliefs. And so it's almost a story devoid of those markers. If you reflect on it, its lessons imbue all of those other stories. Uh, and so we're not going to go into any of the possible attempts, some of the uh, tafsir scholars have made on where the story might have been, who these prophets might have been. We'll leave it in the ambiguity of the Quranic storytelling. You have only two verses to set the scene very, very quickly. And then we have some, what I'm calling introductory dialogue. And this dialogue is between messengers of God and these people. And the people and the messenger saying, we're messengers. And they're saying, no, you're not messengers. You're just people like us. And you guys are lying. And they're saying, no, we really are messengers. You've got to listen to us. And they're saying, no, we're going to kill you guys. They're saying, what's wrong with you people? So that's, that's the dialogue. It's this heated exchange of rejection and messengers. And that shifts to what for me is the central part of the story, which is all of it is a monologue. If you look at a shift, it's just one person. And this one person is at the heart of the entire story then. He's not a messenger nor is he one of the people who denied. It's one of the believers. Again, you can see how beautifully the story connects to the imagery we just had in the previous section. Some people follow the dhikr and some people are these prisoners. And so this man who's a, who is at the centerpiece of the story, he's at the centerpiece of the Quranic message. This is for you guys. This is, uh, you are the center of humanity's story, uh, the slaves of God. And then very quickly, you have your uh, concluding outcome. The final, the final thing to be told about the outcome of what happened and then the story will be left and the su- surah will move on in its argument. And we'll see a lot of central ideas in this story, you know, within the dialogue, common objections people have about prophets, ways to think about that. What are messengers there to do anyway? You know, what, what is their essential task? a very beautiful sort of presentation in the monologue of the meaning and the method of giving da'wah and this final idea that God will avenge his servants. God is with the believers. Their blood is not spilled for free. Their honor is not taken for nothing. Uh, If there's a respite, there's a respite, but God is with his people. Okay, so let's look at this story. We'll go, uh, we have quite a few verses to cover. We'll go into some points of Arabic and we'll, you know, in a bit more detail and other points, we'll just let the story tell us, uh, tell us how it's going to unfold. So it starts off, so, so it starts off here now by the shift. Wadrib lahum mathalan. So darbul mathal, that's what Aubrey very, uh, you know, fairly accurately says, strike for them a similitude. Um, so this story is being called as a mathal. And the word mathal in Arabic can be used for like a proverb, you know, uh, a, pro- a proverbial phrase even, or, you know, stitching time saves nine, you know, stitching time saves nine, you know, these are proverbs if you like. Or it could be, you know, these commonly told tales, don't forget, you know, the boy who cried wolf, you know, this is a case of the guy who cried wolf. So it's calling this story a mathal. And that does not mean that it's untrue. None of the commentators took this as just a figurative story. They all took it as a historical event and some of, many of them tried to tie it down to something historical. But the point is it's saying this is an amazing story. It deserves to be shared amongst people like a proverb so that they will share it often and really reflect on what it's saying. So strike for them this incredible method, this incredible similitude. And the other point of a method is, is a mithal, you know, what are proverbs? They are like something, you liken something to something. And so this coming, this, uh, this coming story, if you like, 
contains examples. Some characters in the story, you can figure out who, are the example for those people who are the prisoners. And some characters in the story, you can figure out who, are the example of the people who tread true. And so the Quran is saying, from those who've come before you, we're going to take out the fat. I'm going to give you a simple story. That's what these people are like. And that's what the outcome is going to be. And all of you guys decide for yourselves. So it's really drilling home. Choose carefully how you respond to this message. I'm going to tell it to you from a story now. So strike for them the story. And the idea of strike, which comes in the Arabic, darb, you know, darb is a strike. And strike, it's like a striking event. Strike it for them. Make it real. Make it palpable for them. By telling them what? An example. Whose example? They're called simply Ashabul Qariya, the inhabitants of the city. And you know, when, when, you, when you tell a story to someone, you, you tell it in a, in a vague way, then you give a bit more detail, then you enter the story. You might tell some children, children, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story of the orphan boy and the orphan girl. The orphan boy and orphan girl live with their grandfather. And so the way you tell it, you know, you'll say, you know, there's a story. Oh, it's a story of these people. And then you get in. Why do you do it like that if it's with children, for example? It's just to get their attention. Oh, there's a story coming. Oh, it's about a boy and a girl. So think about that. Oh, it's about this. And so you, 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 you kind of give it in a vague way just to capture the attention, to create some anticipation. Then you fill in the details. You filled in a bit of detail, there's a bit of anticipation, then you fill in a bit more detail. And that's how it starts in this introductory to verse introduction to the dialogues. It's the story of the people of this Qariya. And I'll talk, come back to the word Qariya in just a little bit. If, it's, it's an important word. Because the point is not the story of the people. We don't really care about the people. It's not saying tell them the story of the people. What we really want to tell them is just a moment in their history a time, that time and the events of that time, if you could picture that time, that scene, that moment, that's the method. What's the time in their history that concerns us? When Ja'ahal Mursalun, the envoys, those who were sent by God came to this town. Reflect on that. Yeah, that time. So again, it, the story is expanding. Give them a story. The people of the town, the moment the messengers came, the moment when two came and they denied them and then we sent a third and they said, so, so you can see how the story has been told. It's a method, people of the city, the time of the coming of the messengers. What was that time? This is the time. And now suddenly the curtains are all open. This is the time, the once upon a time that concerns us right now. When, the time when, Aubrey didn't translate the second when, but the when comes twice. When the messengers came, i.e., when? Now, this is the story. Now it's all going to unfold. Arsalna, again, the, the, there's a we of majesty. We sent to them, i.e., it was for their sake, it was to them. We sent them to, and again, the details aren't being told. We're folding up the intro to get to the dialogues. We sent them to, but then they called them liars. The word then or fa in Arabic, it has the idea of immediacy, you know, and then thereafter, what happened straight away? And it has this other idea of causality. And here's is a kind of reverse causality. If God sends you messengers, then you should immediately say, wow, that's amazing. What has God sent you with? The outcome shouldn't be God sent messengers. And the outcome was, oh, you're a bunch of liars, aren't you? So the, the, that's why Abi translate the then with the word but, i.e. then immediately what should have happened isn't what happened. What immediately happened was the absolute flip of what the causality should have been. So it's a flip of causality. What should have, what that was a cause for was acceptance. What instead happened was the inverse. But then the inverse happened. Lo and behold, what was that? Kadhabu huma. They said, you guys are liars. And so then, so then, we strengthened, we supported that message, that, that mission they had with a third. And then when the third of them came, all together, you know, they, they're kind of supporting each other. All together, they said, Inna ilaykum mursalun. So they're standing together. Maybe this, the one who spoke was one, but the point is they've come together in, in this address. And what have they said? 
Inna, we said last time, inna means like verily, you normally say verily when people have some doubt. And so why are they saying it with inna? Because they've already rejected the first two. So now they're coming, there has been a, there's been a prior rejection. So they're coming with a bit of force now. Verily we, doubt it not, have been sent. I, we are the messengers of God. Now in the Arabic, uh, in, in the English, Aubrey puts unto you at the end, but actually in the Arabic, it comes right in the middle. And so it's, it's to emphasize it. Verily we, doubt it not, to you people have been sent. Like we're not, you know, passing by. Our entire mission, God's entire message is specifically for you. Don't pass us over so lightly. Verily we, doubt it not, to you people have been sent. And so that's the beginning of the dialogues. And so how are these people responding? The, the response dialogue. Qalu, and we don't really care who, which chief, which individual, because the focus is blurring out these insignificant details and just bringing to the fore these dialogues, these exchanges, these heated exchanges, which are meaningful because they express something of the internal um, complexity, if you like, of, of these various characters. So they are responding with three statements. This is like your first block a second block and a conclusion. The first block is this classic, if you like, I've called it the classic objection the Quran speaks, speaks about, which is what? Ma antum. You people are nothing except bashar, just like us. Bashar means human beings. Uh, the word bashara, we, we said last time, if some of you recall, it actually means skin. And so bashar means, you know, the human being, you know, you're, you're the exact same animal as us. You haven't got fur, you haven't got feathers. You are the, literally the same creature as us. There's no difference. You're exactly the same animal, the same species. And the all merciful has sent nothing down at all. This is your, your second part now. The all merciful has sent nothing. Uh, it's interesting, this use of the phrase, the all merciful. Some scholars felt this is quoting some term that those people used, um, a reference to a higher force, the higher deity, the one who gives all blessings. Because one of the ongoing um, issues that the Quran speaks of when these people reject the messengers are always these two. Number one, you're not so special. Why have I got to surrender to you? A and B, if you are so special, then why am I the rich one? Why am I the leader? Why are you just, you know, why am I so powerful? Why are you not uh, the man full of riches? And so it makes sense that when they think of God, they think of God the loving, because God loves me. I'm the powerful. So the all merciful one whose compassion fills, he sent nothing down. Uh, what are you talking about? And so it, it's, it's a reference almost of, you know, we're quite special and we're living in bliss, and there's nothing else that God has sent. There's only one possible conclusion. If you're a man like us, and it's not possible God would have sent anything, what's left? You guys are nothing but liars. And Aubrey is very accurate here, because they didn't say you are liars. They used this, a, uh, a present tense verb. Present tense verb means like he is eating. What does it mean? Every time you look at him, he's putting something in his mouth. It's, a, it's an ongoing action. It's being renewed in every moment. So what they're saying is, every time you open your mouths, there's a lie coming out. I, everything you're saying in every moment, every time you speak about this topic that we don't like, it's nothing but a bunch of lies, one after one. So you, you know, quite correct, accurately rendered, you are speaking only lies. So this is a classic objection about the fact that flesh is flesh, we are chosen, God sent nothing. What are you except speaking nonsense? Outright objection. And the response from them is not one of argument in this story, because the focus of this story is we're just paving the way towards this monologue, which is just about to come. And so what the story is folding up is they've made their arguments. They've made their case for God, for what God deserves of worship, what society deserves of fairness and justice. All that's been done. So all that's left is just to emphasize, don't be too hasty. You've got to be careful now. Qalu, so they replied in their response. Rabbuna ya'lamu. And they say this is an oath. 
it's it's almost like saying by god wallahi why do you do oath swearing because they've rejected so so first you say i'm a messenger they say no you're not and they say inna no verily i'm a messenger they say no no they say by god i'm a messenger so in in rhetoric they say this is the highest way to emphasize if there's been a lot of denial of what you're saying they've come with the oath now by god we are messengers but the oath has come in the form of not a uh, simple oath swearing by god it came in the form of a phrase our lord knows it's it's an oath by the very knowledge of god so be careful god knows this to be true and who is god he's our lord if we have time today we'll come back later to speak about the word rub this sort of very nurturing lord our nurturing lord because this indicates a a quranic argument in other surahs in surah ibrahim when the people said you're nothing but men like us the response in that surah was in nahnu illa basharun mithlukum yes we are nothing at all but men like you walakinna allaha yamunu ala man yasha min ibadi but god gives his grace to whomever he wills of his servants that's quoted elsewhere but over here all we see is this idea that our nurturing care, caring lord who's taken us to this level you see us in he knows so i warn you don't contradict his knowledge he knows it's another way of saying i swear by the knowledge of my lord inna verily we to you surely and again this has been added to last time sentence a double surely so our lord knows verily surely to you we are messengers wa ma alaina illa al balagh al mubin there is nothing on us literally on us meaning there's no duty on us there's no duty we have to discharge except al balagh al mubin balagha means something has arrived somewhere uh some of you might know the word uh tablighh which means to convey something so that it arrives somewhere and the balagh is just an emphatic idea that you've conveyed something and you've ensured that it's arrived you've you've taken it to its destination so the messengers their only job is to ensure the message reaches home what what does that mean it means they don't simply say oh god is one you have to worship him and you have to be fair to each other you have to uphold his justice on earth where we 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 are off now because you haven't made sure they understood so the balagh is to really make sure we saw last time the quran speaks with you know different you know examples stories threats promises it's saying a whole host of ways to tell you something to make sure the message reaches home after which your only uh, thing that would be stopping you is your own complexity your own the issues that we've raised last time so they're saying we have no job don't demand more from us we're not saying anything more don't demand us to show you more than we've shown we have a job and our job was to make sure the message reached home and we have to make sure it does that in an incredibly clear way maybe later we'll come back to something about the nuances of the word mubin it just means incredibly clear there's no doubt about it so our task was to make sure the message reached and it was very very clear nothing ambiguous at all that's all we've had to do that's all he's tasked us to do and we've and don't demand of us any more than that that's all we're claiming we're not claiming more than that so listen carefully tread carefully because we're his messengers and we're here for you and so now they come back with even more pride so these people now come back with the, with the, with the, with even more pride they don't want to give arguments they're like fed up qalu inna tatayyarna bikum we find bad luck you guys are bad luck for us tatayyarna we have found the birds in you you know the word tayr in arabic means birds and uh and birds uh for people they say the arabs would find omen you know if the birds fly in from one direction oh that's a good sign if they fly out from another direction that's seen as being like a bad sign and so so the word of the bird then is used to find is used to ind- indicate omens inna tatayyarna bikum we find real you guys are really bad luck you guys are going to bring disaster upon us 
what is this a reference to? It could be all sorts. You know, the, the, the Mufassirin say this is the habit of such, of such, you know, f forsaken people that whatever gives them more of what they want, they consider it good luck. Oh, it was good luck today. Um, you know, we, we, we were lucky. We, we robbed the bank and we killed the guard and no one caught us. And they consider this great luck, not because it's brought any good for themselves, but because what suited them uh, is, what, is what came to them. And they, considered, and they consider everything that doesn't suit them to be bad luck. And so the prophets aren't coming to suit them. They're saying, you guys got to change your ways. You guys have got to get a bit humble. You have to think carefully about, about God, about people, about worship, about what you're doing in, in this life. Your actions have consequence. None of this is suiting to what these people want. So it's all bad luck. All of it is bad luck. And the other angle is because the, they're bringing, because people are always entrenched. They have their hierarchies. They have their temples. They have their omens and they have their, the order of business, the powerful and the weak. And, they, and that's the way, the way it runs. And the messengers come to challenge a particular status quo always. And instead, of, and so they have this idea, this is weird, this is different, must be bad luck. You guys are gonna cause ruin to us. So we find bad luck in you guys. And so all they have is this threat. The lamb indicates an implied oath. We swear, if you don't stop, they didn't even say stop, you know, this message or stop. Just you guys better stop, completely stop. We swear, if you don't stop, what's going to happen? We will pelt you. And we swear that a very painful punishment from us, the mighty, is going to touch you. So that they think so, uh, so much of them. So using all the might they can muster, say, what on earth do you think you three people are? This is our town. We are the mighty. And if you don't stop this very second, we will pelt you. And our punishment is so severe, if it even touches you, you will realize that you're, that you, you've, that you're in the wrong. And it's a very painful thing indeed, a torment of such pain from us. You will be wishing for death. So just watch out, shut up now, stop it now. Enough of this bad luck. And then they come back, the final, the final sort of exchange in the, in the dialogue. قالوا, قالوا معكم. And so they've come back also with, with, with stern words, stern words to, to suit that, that stern setting. Literally, your bird is with you. This omen you're looking for, you are your omen. You are your own omen. If, if bad luck comes to you after we're through, it's because of what you did. Every man carries his luck with him. Your actions, the way you are, the way you conduct yourselves, the way you are with God, the way you are with people, that's your omen. If good, then good. And if bad, then bad. Foolish you are to blame that on us. Your omen is with you. That's a statement of almost like disgust. This is, a, this is a condition without a response. This is a question, you know, of, you can say disgust. And it's just a condition. And again, Aubrey is very literal. He doesn't try to fill it in for you. He just says, if you are reminded, and that's it. The question stops there. Is it that... Our reminding you, that's it, it's just dhikr. Remember this, this phrase that came last time, it's just dhikr. Reminding you of something, if you were to be still, if you were to be silent, if you were to forget all this heat and just listen to what we're saying, you'd find it familiar. You'd find it sensible. You'll find it tranquil. It's just the dhikr. And is it that we've given you a dhikr that you are now threatening to kill the messengers of God? What kind of an outcome is that? No, it's not the dhikr that leads to this outcome. It's you. You, again, this is an emphatic sentence in that it's a verbless, complete sentence of nouns. You are a people whose mark is excess, israf. Israf means being without restraint. It's used sometimes to mean without restraint in property, to be wasteful. 
And it means any kind of, any kind of way of being excessive without any restraint at all. How did the surah start last time? It was Hakim. Hakim, we said, was all about restraint. Wisdom is about restraining so that everything stays in its place. Nothing goes outside of its place, which is called transgression. And you are a people, nothing is in its place. You have nothing of wisdom. You have nothing of restraint. Look at you, the messengers of God who've come to you. You should have sought blessing in them. Instead, you find nothing but curses from them and you wanted to, to, to kill them. And now my friends, if this was a, a scene with, with the curtains or with the camera, the camera is shifting. Well, if you were to see the scene right now, everyone's eyes in this heated exchange, everyone starts looking off into the distance. And so you find yourself looking off into the distance with them. And the rest of the story, everything else cries out. The camera is focused onto this one figure, this one figure who's at the heart of the story now, neither a prophet nor a denier. He's the, the last person. He closely followed the remembrance and he has awe of the all-merciful unseen. What does the story say? And came a man. So Aubrey says came a man, but the Quran emphasizes a particular detail here in the literal translation. And came from the furthest, most extremity of that town came a man hastening. Came a man hastening. Why emphasize this extremity instead of the man? Came from the furthest point of that town. There's a few things in this. First of all, it shows that the message, the messengers did their job. Their message did reach the people of that town. And that's why the person at the furthest part has come. There's also something in this to show ultimately God guides whomever he wills. And that's a really important message for the early believers to whom this surah is being directly revealed. The Muslims in Mecca and the Prophet ﷺ in his preaching, you know, their interest was that the, that, the, that, the, that the big people of their town, if they would become Muslim, then everyone would, would become Muslim. But it was the chieftains who were opposing. And implicit in this story is what? That don't worry. God's plan will be fulfilled and God will guide, but he'll guide whomever he wills. And it might well be that all your focus is on someone in front of you, but it's somebody right off, which is the one that will really be bearing your message. And that's exactly what happened in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that all of his effort was with his people. But who were the ones who really supported his message? It was these farmers at an oasis, a few days journey in a place called Yathrib, which would coincidentally perhaps be, be termed finally Medina, the Medina of the Prophet ﷺ. They came to the help. He did his job. The message reached, but these chieftains in front of him weren't the ones who were, who were going to be bearing it. So what's the internal idea that God will choose the people to bear his message? And they might not be the people that you're thinking or expecting. Just do your job. Let it be conveyed and God will do the rest. And the last thing to point out that Ibn Ashur points out is that the furthest point of a town, who lives there? If you think of an old town, old Damascus or old any old town, at the center of town will be what? Will be your temples, you know, your, your, your high priests and the people who manage that whole aspect of a town will be the king, the governor's office, uh, the center of police. Then, the, then you have... The, the, the central bazaar, uh, uh, and then you'll have the, you know, the great dwellings of the people who are central and, and so on. You'll have the nice houses and then right at the edge of town, you'd have the people whose livelihood is maybe outside of the town. The farmers, the people who tend to the fields, people who have little, little crafts of their own. Ibn Ashur just points out that it very often happens and it's one of the Quranic themes that the people who follow the messengers the most typically are not tied to the center because the center is where you have pride and this fear of 
this upturning of the order that people are taking advantage of. That's why they oppose the messengers, because it means that they'll have to come down a few notches in society. But the people at the outside of town, they're not surrendered, they're not beholden to the power structures of the capital and the money and the business and the kings and trying to be close. They tend to be free men, free-minded, able to choose freely for themselves. So it very, very often happens that people who are less tied to these entrapped interests of money and wealth, their minds are clearer. And most importantly, their, their hearts are clearer. And you'll see how clear hearted this man is. He's come running right from the edge of the town. And he's coming, yes, ah, you know, it emphasizes he came hastening. He really, that's why, you know, everyone's turned, the camera has shifted and all you see is this man. And what's he, what's, why is he hastening? He just has a message. Qala, his monologue is now starting. Qala, ya qawmi, ittabi'u al-mursaleen. And we'll, and there's a, there's a lot of interest in the way he's phrasing now his part of this monologue. First of all, how does he refer to these people? He's clearly come, you know, what's preceded in the story? Oh, they're about to kill the messengers. He's, as you'll see, he's, he's believed in these messengers. How is he situating himself? He's not saying, oh, you enemies of God. Oh, you kafirs. Oh, you God forsaken people. He, what's he saying? He's saying, oh, my people. And this, this idea is going to uh, feed through all of, his, all of his wording right now, as we're going to see. He's speaking to them from a message of concern. He's saying, look, you're my people. You're my tribe. I only want for you what I want for myself. Oh, my people, closely follow these messengers. So just a very brief message, almost like if you imagine he's just come, he wanted to quickly say something before he to catch his breath. Oh, people, follow the messengers, just, just to get it out in a very, very short, very, very short set of words. Uh, ittiba, we, is, ittiba is an interesting word. He's going to use it again. Ittiba means to closely follow something. Again, it's part of the imagery of treading a, a, upon this path we've been seeing throughout. Closely follow these messengers. He repeats it again. Man la ajran wa hum Closely follow someone when these are their two traits. What are the two traits? They're not asking any wage from you because the first assumption people have when someone comes to give them advice, when the messengers of God come to warn people, the first assumption is you just want me to come down a few notches so you can go up. You want the money, you want the palaces, you want, the, you want all the grandeur that comes along with it. Go away, don't, don't ask me for what's mine. And so he's saying, guys, think carefully. They've never in any moment, and this is like a present tense verb. Remember I said present tense is about renewal. It keeps expressing itself. In no moment of theirs have they ever shown you that they want anything in return at all. Ajran ma, any wage at all, anything in return, look carefully. They've never in any moment sought anything for themselves. So leave that accusation aside and look at who they actually are. Hum muhtadun. This is now a noun sentence, no verbs. It's to show that they're firmly entrenched. It's the way that they are. They're guided. They speak wisdom. What they speak is balanced. What they convey is the only thing that makes extreme and absolute sense. It is the truth itself, and they'll never misguide you. The way that they are, look at them. These are the people you should be following. And now is an interesting shift. What's the shift? It's like he's speaking about himself. Now he's going to make arguments about God. So his first, if the first impulse was to come to the aid of the messengers, because these were the people who were being threatened. So the first impulse is, guys, please listen to these people. They don't want anything from you. It's like, if you, if you were to follow them, you lose none of your money and you gain everything of the good that they have. Why would you not want to listen to these people? So the first thing is just listen. There's no reason you have to not listen to them. Now he's going to make some arguments and the arguments are about the core message of what these messengers have brought, which is what? To believe truly in the one God. So he wants to convey something in the short moment he has when the whole town is clearly set, you know, the main people in town are in that square, perhaps, and he's come and he's got that moment with them. He's got that attention. He wants to convey something. And so he, 
he could have said, what's wrong with you people that you don't worship the one who created you? But the problem is when you direct an accusation to someone, the immediate response is, why are you talking about me? I'm perfect, shut up. What right do you have to tell me something? And so instead he talks about himself. So no one can take it as an accusation of them because, and so no one will quickly feel the need to reject what he's saying. And so he's saying, Wamali, what is with me that I should not worship the one who originated me? You can't argue with that because he's talking about himself. It's not an accusation, it's not an attack. It's a very gentle way to say, listen, I've chosen this for myself. What is with me if I should not lower myself to the one who's originated me? Ibadah, Ibadah we translate it as worship. They say in Arabic, it literally means, you know, if you have the desert and then you have a path on which people have trodden on or their land cruisers nowadays have trodden on, what you will see is it's, it's become down patted. It's become like a road in the desert. You can see, oh, that's where all the cars go. They don't go anywhere else. You've kind of formed a road. So they call this a tariq mu'abbad. It's the path on which the feet have trodden. And so it's become compressed. And so ibadah is about being low trodden, being lowly, being, if you like, abased. And so in the Fatiha, we recite, you know, iyaka na'budu, which literally means to you alone do we completely abase ourselves. Only you deserve, you are the only one who deserves we should negate ourselves in front of only you, none but you. None deserves this level of the extreme negation of everything we have, every sense of worth that we could possibly imagine for ourselves, except you. So he says, what's wrong with me? I'm thinking, what's, what's wrong with me if I shouldn't direct my being, my energy, everything I've got to adore and to glorify and to worship who? The one who, he's going to refer to God with three different titles, each having a bit of an argument within them. The one who fatarani. Fatara literally in Arabic means to split open something. And so the use is to mean to originate. You know, I was nothing and lo and behold, there I was. Doesn't it make sense? The one who's brought me out from nothing deserves that I should utterly direct myself to him. But the goal of the argument really was the people in front of him. And that's why he hints at that by saying, and you guys are going back to him. What's wrong with me that I shouldn't surrender to the one who created me and be grateful? And you are going back to him. So think about consequences here, guys. Okay, I've got, now we've got to keep track of uh, iftar times here. I, I do apologize. Where are we? Where's the iftar time gone? Okay, so this might be cutting this one tight. You might have to do one of those, you know, date and water kind of iftars and maybe not the samosa daybari kind of iftars. Maybe we'll, we'll have to see. If you can uh, kindly give me another, Let's, try, let's see what we can get to in, in 10 minutes. Do share the questions. Inshallah, I do say we'll try and come to them, but let's try and finish this, uh, this account. Again, it's a question to himself, showing almost like, what's, why would I do that? Again, no one can challenge him. He's speaking to the crowd through himself. Shall I take from other than him gods? And there's a sort of argument in that because... What's the argument? Is God the one that you take for yourself? Is it an act of you that makes someone God? Or is it God? Is God God? Is it a, a statement of reality? So it says, should I just take things for myself and call them gods when the all merciful one, you know, the one who's truly giving everything that's here, if he wishes to harm me, then this thing that I've taken, how's it gonna help me? Because clearly the one who, first of all, originates from nothing, that's the first statement of who should be the one you worship, lower yourself before completely. And secondly, the one who everything is his gift, everything is his gift. If that one wants to harm me, then these things I've taken for myself, they can't, uh, they can't avail me anything. Or in the Arabic, they can't do any intercession. They have no prestige are they really going to stop him the thing that i've chosen to take are they going to rescue me when the one who everything is his gift wishes not to give me that gift i mean i'd be a fool so that he says in me 
then he answers his own question. No, guys. So imagine they're just watching him almost talk to himself. Would I do that? Come on, I can't do that. Because in me, verily, doubt it not, in that case, surely I am inside. I'm completely lost in what? In error. Dalal is another one of those traveling words. Because dalal means to be lost. You know, if you're traveling somewhere, you, you, you just get lost. You don't know where you are. So it's another one of those, those imagery of traveling true to God or, or getting lost and not knowing where you are anymore. So uh, if I were to do that foolish thing, I would be drowning inside an incredible error. This is indefinite. Remember I said last time, indefinite is for magnitude here. Mubin, so clear. Like, I'm a fool, guys. I'd be a fool if I did that. So what's the conclusion? There's only one conclusion to these arguments. <inaudible> Verily, I doubt it not. There's only one conclusion I can make to what I've just said. I have believed in your Lord. This is the third reference to Allah. The first was the one who created us from nothing. One was the one whose gifts cover everything. And the last one is that he is your Rabb. The word rub, they say it comes from tarbiya, which means training, taking something from very gently from stage to stage to stage to stage to stage to stage to its perfection. So what he's saying is the one who's been with you since you were nothing but cells in the womb of your mother, and he's given you what he's given you in every moment, that real Lord of yours, he's the one I've believed in. First ma'un, so please listen to me. What happens next, guys? There's a bit of a jump in the narrative. Let's read the English. Can you guys please type, as a, uh, just quickly, what do you think happened in the interim and why was it not shared with us? Two questions for you guys. I haven't got time to answer your questions. Maybe you have time to answer my questions. What happened between the last verse in this one and this one and why was it not shared with us? And the translation sim simply says, it was said, enter paradise. And he said, ah, oh, would that my people had knowledge that my Lord has forgiven me and made me of these, uh, of these messengers uh, uh, and made me amongst those honored. Okay, so we have Safiya Shahid or Shahid, and Shahid is quite appropriate for our topic here. Uh, what happened? Because if you look carefully, he's giving them a message and the very next scene he's being told enter paradise. And he says, oh, if only they knew God forgave me. And if that's not clear to you, look at the next, the concluding verse of that story. Oh, we didn't avenge him with armies. It was just a scream and they were destroyed. So there's only one conclusion of what's happened, which is that they killed him. Okay, the next question is, why haven't we been told that? Uh, why aren't we told that? Because in one sense, that's a very insignificant part of his story. That's not the point, because what you want to focus on, imagine this is the, the cameras are on this man. Imagine what the, 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 the Quranic narrative, which is skipping some of these small details. You're looking at the man, you think, oh my people, I'd be wrong if I did that. I believe in your Lord. And the very next scene is what? Poof. Like he's literally blown out of his body and he's up traveling towards heaven and he's being told, Enter the garden. You are the chosen one. It's, it's a sign of incredible glory. His picture is nothing but glorious. He did an incredible stand of honor, of justice. He stood by the messengers. And all you need to know next is poof. He kind of broke out of his body and his soul was there and he won. That's it. He's won. And so the killing is an insignificant detail in his story. And it's an insignificant detail in the story of these messengers and the story of those who are with them. God will avenge you. Do the honorable stand because what really matters is the final standing. And the final standing is what matters. And this guy won. He was one step to heaven. And that's what, what, what concerns us. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that if the, if, if the detail came as, oh, they, they, they uh, killed him, then the non-believers hearing the story from the Prophet Sallallahu would have thought, oh, good, we, you know, our, our gang got their, you know, got what they, what, what they should have done and we're going to do the same to you. And so, no, the story says, no, no, what concerns you is not that. What concerns the baddies is this. 
what, what is what they got. So the story is focusing what each person needs to know. The, the believer sharing the story is he did the good stand. And that's why as soon as he went through, he just heard that voice enter the garden. And all he wanted to say was, oh, if only my people knew of what that incredible forgiveness of, of my Lord and that he's really made me truly honored. And what you see in this movement, this, this, this incredible, like I said, poof, he's just out of his body. That's it. He's won. There's no more need for the body if you've won. And that's it. And in that moment, he's in a realm of incredible purity. In that realm of incredible purity, there is no hatred. There is nothing because his people just hastened him on to this victory. Uh, there's nothing left except the purity of that place. And so all he was is he wishes for his people well. And so what is the story really sharing at its heart is what it means to call people to God. At its very heart is wishing them well. And that's why the message of the Prophet Sallallahu in the 13 years of in Mecca, it was just the message of wishing the family well, doing good for the family, because all of Quraysh was in the family. And they were and the prophet the Muslims were being told, bear their torture with, with patience and deliver the message. Bear their torture with patience, deliver the message. And so this story suits exactly that setting uh, of what the believers were in. And the purity of this man is even on the other side, his thought was, wow, God's forgiveness is so great, if only they could have known where I am. And this is the quick conclusion. Is that immediately after him, these people deserve that they should be finished because God avenges his believers. These lives are precious. Your lives are precious. And, but Allah says, no, it wasn't our way that because these people have already denied their messengers. They've denied the signs the messengers have brought. They've not been told to us, the miracles, the arguments, and they've gotten back to this person. And so all we have, all we've been told is we did not send on his people after him, after he had gone any army at all from the heaven, nor is that our way. Why? Because these criminals are worth little. They're not, they don't, they're not so special that a huge army on horses and a big extravaganza should come. God wants to belittle them because that's what they really are. They acted big, but they were nothing. And so the final part of the story is what? In كانت إلا صيحة واحدة فإذاهم خامدون. It was nothing but a single scream. An angel let out a scream. That was it. And they were dying embers. Khumud in Arabic is a word for fire when it just dies down. The, you know, the fire comes down and all you have are the embers and the ashes. So it's almost like a metaphoric idea. You know, they were lively with their fire. It was just a scream. And what was left? The fires died down and they were done. And the messengers were avenged. And the believer was avenged and he won and they lost. And so you can see how it's an incredible story, despite the fact there's no details of the place, the characters, about common themes of objections, common answers. What the da'wah is, ultimately it's calling people to God and it has to be done with sincere well-wishing. And God is with the believers. Be not afraid, any of you. And even if harm befalls you, that harm is not, not even a footnote in your story because your story is the real story. It's what comes thereafter. So it's giving incredible strength to people. Fear not the harm. Your story is the poof when you blow out of your body and there you are. There you are with your Lord. Jalla Jalaluhu. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So uh, thank you all very much. I think this really is the iftar time, isn't it not? Oh, good. We have a few more minutes if you have your dates and water ready. If you're doing the date and water iftar, if not, I guess you have to uh, do the other things. Um, I've just uh, very quickly, you're all free to tend to your uh, tend to your matters. If I just take there were some less some questions that were asked. Uh, there was a question on how much do you focus on building a legacy and how much do you focus on sending things forward? In truth, 
all of that is what is what we send forward because ultimately what we've been told is what does it mean to follow the messengers what does it mean to follow the story of this one man as well is that following the message of god part of that is wishing well for people and so necessarily a part of that is devotion to god and a part of that is doing something for people what you do in devotion to god is what you send forward and what you do in goodness to people that's what gets left behind because any impact you have on a person will reach a person will reach a person and the more manifest of these things you know the teaching the colleges the mosques the the orchards you know the very great things they're just trying to be more and more permanent in all of that so it's not about one or the other it's about trying to follow the message as best as we can which will direct us always to both uh Yes, yeah, so something about the word method. Would it, would it be correct to say similarity in this context means to show an example, a sort of consequence of one's actions? Yes, because this story, all of it, it's proverbial, it's great, recount it often, learn from it frequently. But yes, it's an example exactly for these particular people and these kinds of choices. It's an example for us. Who do you want to be like? Choose carefully. So it's proverbial and it's a clear example. for two particular types of groups uh yeah it's really interesting why is the quran using the word merciful on the tongues of these disbelievers and so there's a debate amongst the scholars is the quran quoting them and they used some word meaning the old merciful or is the quran in telling that story using this term as part of its argument structure uh because you know when they said the old merciful sent nothing the commentator said well actually if he was all merciful he would want to guide you with something so that already works against you his kindnesses to you which you are palpable are complete when he also sends you these messengers as well so sometimes the quran recounts a story and it presents them in a package for us to think about in its larger argument in the surah or it could be they said a phrase so the scholars who say it's a phrase of what they said some of them say it's because they felt yeah they're living in bliss And so they say yeah but the source of all of this bliss and nothing because he's chosen us right because we're because we're blessed right so it's whatever they said goes back to this uh, this word and one of the commentators had a very odd idea that they didn't believe in god but they believed in a higher deity so that the, the god they believed in or in their very complicated hierarchy the one at the top is the god of mercy so he took it as a historical statement to fit into a particular paradigm So there's different ways that you could answer this question of why the disbelievers would use the word rahman. Is Sheikh Nuddin it is book in English I'm not aware it actually might be but I'm just not aware maybe someone can post to look it up. Is this, I think it's just called Ulum al-Qur'an. Uh yeah just very very quickly there I I I mentioned in my last lesson that Yasin is to alert listeners you know here are some letters it it's going to grab the attention without speaking sentences. it is a challenge you know compose speech with these letters if you can and i said a sort of mystery they said what do you mean by the mystery all i meant by that was scholars still try to reflect down to our time are there other forms of significance in these letters that, that that's all i meant and some scholars have particular theories and like i said modern people think about mathematics and so all i wanted to say was there could be other things going on but the basic Uh, what the mufassirin tend to bring it back to were the two ideas alerting the listener and challenging uh, these early arabs uh, these recipients of uh, of this message what are the rewards of reading yasin every day yeah that's a that's a that, that's a good question maybe we can gather some re- some reports on this what what we do know is it is of the of one of the most oft recited surahs and very frequently people recite it you know daily daily after fajr uh, almost like a dua to fulfill needs we mentioned some of these things uh, last time in terms of particular hadiths on particular rewards uh, inshallah I'll, I'll, if i come across something uh, you know particular the way you're asking i'll try and bring it back to you thank you all very very much for your time i do apologize if i've gone on again like last time feel free you know listen to it again you can take your notes uh, inshallah we'll find a way also for you to ask questions we can ask it to the social media perhaps Uh, in some points of arabic i went into detail in some i just wanted to focus on the structure and so we'll, we'll go through the surah like that uh, bi idhnillah ta'ala 
I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you, bless all of your fasts, uh, and to uh, and to accept from you all uh, your uh, your efforts in this blessed month. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.